Hey everyone, this is Cody, and today I'll be reviewing this interesting filter. This is the IDAS DTD, or Dusk to Daylight filter. Now hopefully you even see this video because the algorithm has been killing small content creators lately, so we'll see how many views this gets. Uh, but this fil filter is super interesting. It covers a wide variety of bands, so you'll get some comet bands in there, like the diatomic carbon and the really interesting ionized carbon monoxide band. But you also get like what you would typically see with the IDAS NBZ, where you get the oxygen 3 band and the hydrogen alpha band. And then even with the IDAS GNB that has a big infrared transmission, you get that with this filter too. So from what I understand, this filter is pretty popular in Japan, but it's not well known here in the United States. So IDAS did send me one of these for free so I could review it. Now I think it's important to mention that. I'm always honest in my reviews, but it is important to tell, tell you that I did not pay for this filter, so please keep that in mind when you're listening to the information that I give you today. So as always, um, I'll go ahead and dive into this uh, filter review. We'll cover some of the uh, transmission graphs, take a look at those, and the performance of the filter itself. So let's jump into it. I'm going to pause real quick. This is Editor Cody now. Throughout the whole video, I call this filter the Dusk to Daylight filter. It's actually called the Dusk to Dawn filter. I don't know how I did not catch that throughout the entire time I filmed the video that I was saying the wrong name for the filter. So I thought I'd correct that now. It is the Dusk to Dawn filter. So just keep that in mind throughout the video. So let's go ahead and continue. Now this video is basically a part two to my DZ filter slider review. So if you didn't see that last video I made, be sure to check it out if you're interested in these DZ filter sliders. They go right into the ZWO M54 Gen 2 filter drawer, and what's cool about them is they have a larger aperture than a typical 2-inch filter. So if you ever see any vignetting from your filter with your full-size camera, be sure to check out the DZ filters because they do give you a larger aperture. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk a little bit about what this filter can do. So IDAS description is a new generation filter covering multiple objects including comets, galaxies, the Milky Way, and emission and reflection nebulae by making use of the extra transmission in the near infrared region. Now here they just have the mounting types for the filter. I have the, the DZ style that goes in the ZWO M54 Gen 2 filter drawers, which I really like, but obviously they offer a standard M48 or two inch style filter uh, as well. Now I'm gonna talk about star halos in a little bit, so I'll wait on this, but I will use the data that they share here. Uh, but what's cool is you do get that hydrogen alpha and oxygen 3 regions pass in the same manner as the NBZ, um, but you also get some wider bands too. So what's cool about this filter is it can be used for landscape astrophotography. Now that's not really my thing. I'd love to get into it more. I just don't have the time. Uh, but look at this shot. This is amazing. Uh, just beautiful composition here. Great background and foreground and just really nice color in the image. So I really like this shot that IDAS has on their website, courtesy of Mr. Bernat Font. Uh, excellent image there. So you can use this for landscape photography and imaging the Milky Way, which is pretty cool. Now, if we look at the uh, filter itself and some of these transmission bands, you have a really wide band here in the near infrared area. So uh, they say, you know, IR section with very low light pollution. And if you have, you know, if you have a camera like the IMX 585 that's really infrared sensitive, you could do some really good work in here. Uh, band 3 is interesting in that it passes the H-alpha as well as the sulfur 2. So the sulfur 2 is at 672 nanometers, which is pretty much right between this 650, 700 right here. So if I go straight up right between those, you're getting roughly 80 to 90% transmission of that sulfur 2 line, which is really good. And then, of course, at the 656 nanometer line, the hydrogen alpha is being passed at about 90% or even more than that, honestly. It's probably about 95%. So excellent transmission of both the sulfur 2 and the hydrogen alpha um, emission lines there. If we go to band number 2, here you have some of the, the comet ion. Uh, this would be the diatomic carbon that you see here, as well as the oxygen 3. Uh, if I go to about 486, uh, that's going to be like right about 3 quarters of the way down here. You're getting a little bit of transmission of the hydrogen beta line, but but not much. So this is primarily focused on on that comet band as well as the oxygen three, which both of these are also transmitted at a, a high rate, roughly 90, 95 percent or so. And then lastly, down here in the blue, 
you have the the band one comet ion tails and this is where you're going to see that ionized carbon monoxide so again just a really interesting filter in that you're getting a lot of ir pass here you're getting hydrogen alpha and the sulfur two emission lines oxygen three some of the diatomic carbon as well as the ionized carbon monoxide so there's a lot you can do with the filter you can image galaxies the milky way emission nebula reflection nebula comets pretty pretty cool so as i scroll down here um, you'll actually see some of these sources of light pollution so here high pressure sodium lamp you can see this is pretty much all chopped out by the filter there as, as any good broadband light pollution filter should chop that out uh, the mercury lamp you can see that's kind of gone as well now of course with leds they kind of emit across the visible spectrum so it's really hard to get rid of all of that so you will get some transmission of the the white led and there's not a whole lot you can do about that so but you'll notice here you do have a large section of it that is that is cut out which is nice so it does overall it works pretty well as a good light pollution filter as well um, but you'll notice over here you don't really see any of that led in the near infrared and that's kind of the benefit of leds is you don't waste a lot of your light as heat kind of like you do with candescent bulbs or your kind of your standard household bulbs they're very inefficient most of their light is in the infrared and you only get a small amount in the visible band that's the huge benefit behind led is you're not wasting a lot of that energy as heat and so you won't really see a lot of that led in the infrared at all and so this is a good area to shoot if your camera is sensitive to it uh, and then again looking here at comets a little bit more specifically so the blue is the uh the ionized carbon monoxide here that is a really pretty color in comets by the way and then the green is that c2 the diatomic uh, carbon now with comets you don't really see a ton of the green in the tail and that's because diatomic carbon is unstable so you'll see it primarily in the coma and then as it starts to fade off into the tail kind of breaks down and you don't really see it much anymore so the the diatomic carbon is is passed through with the dtd filter so you'll get those excellent transmission of the the diatomic carbon in the the coma of the comet here uh, and then you'll see some start to see some of the blues in the comet tails from that ionized carbon monoxide i think that's a really cool feature of this filter another cool thing is here if i check out this image this is by uh shigemi numazawa you have the crescent nebula so obviously that hydrogen alpha transmission coming through but you're also getting the comet transmission coming through because the filter does pass both of those bands so i think that's that's pretty neat there scrolling down this graph is more looking just specifically at emission and reflection nebula. So the hydrogen beta, like I said, that line, uh, not passed a ton through here, but the oxygen three really coming through, the hydrogen alpha really coming through. So yeah, overall it's a, a pretty interesting filter and there's some really cool images they post on their website of various objects that you can see, you can image with this filter. So uh, the Orion Nebula, again, just a, an excellent shot here. Very kind of a interesting color scheme out here. The Ghost Nebula looks nice. The uh, uh, M83, this one looks pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure how many subs are in here. Uh, not that I'm critiquing the image or anything. It does have a little bit of a noise in it, but that's okay. Um, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Again, kind of interesting colors you get through here. So yeah, definitely go ahead and check out the website on the DTD filter if you're interested in kind of learning more about it. Hopefully I covered a lot of it, but the last thing I just want to talk about, um, they do have the quantum efficiency data here at the bottom. And as I mentioned with the 585 sensor, that passes, that's very efficient in the near infrared. So this infrared band over here, you're getting a lot of this transmission that's going to be uh, recorded on that 585 sensor. So. If you're interested in near infrared imaging, the DTD and the 585 would be excellent. But if you look at the 294 sensor, obviously it's infrared uh, quantum efficiency is, is not very good. So it's not going to be as effective with a sensor like the 294, but the 585, really good transmission throughout, uh, really good quantum efficiency throughout. So yeah, these the, the filter plus the 585 would be a really good combination. 
and then just scrolling down to finish things off. Look at this comparison between the Orion Nebula taken with the Dusk to Daylight filter as well as the GNB filter. Now I've also reviewed the GNB filter. It also has excellent transmission in the near infrared, so the IMX585 sensor works great with the GNB as well. But one thing I really notice here between these two images is the blues. So with the dust to daylight filter, those blues come in so nicely because of the, you know, you get the blue comet transmission, the green, com green comet transmission. These colors, I think, come in a lot better and it tends to look a bit more natural. Uh, also, some of this dust here, you can see the big difference just looks excellent. So I actually prefer the DTD filter version of this Orion shot compared to the GNB. And this just kind of shows what the filter can do because you're getting that hydrogen alpha and you know the sulfur two emission lines coming through. You're getting the blues and the greens and you're also getting some of this, this dustiness too. So overall, I think the filter it's very interesting just how many lines it does pass through, but image image wise looks excellent. I need to discuss star halos with the DTD filter. Now, most modern astrophotography cameras are optimized for the visible wavelengths. If you look at the protective glass over the sensors, the anti-reflection coatings there are primarily optimized for the visible bands, not really the near UV or near infrared. Now, because this filter does transmit so much near infrared, there will be internal reflections and star halos. Now, what's cool though, is IDAS actually compares those star halos to the NBZ, so you can kind of get a feel for just how bad they are. And I actually have the NBZ right here. So if you consider the NBZ star halos to have a magnitude of one, well, if you're using the 294 sensor and the DTD filter, your star halos will be 7.9 times that. If you're using the DTD with the 585 sensor, they're going to be 23.7 times the NBZ. So that seems like a lot when you're using the DTD, but the NBZ produces such little star halos that it's honestly not that big of a deal to me. I use this with the uh, Sony IMX 571 sensor and I don't really notice that bad of star haloing. So to me, it's not really a big deal, but it's definitely something that you need to consider if you're seriously looking at this filter. Now let's take a look at a couple of images I took here. So this is the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula, one of my favorite targets in Cygnus. Uh, you'll see that the process image, honestly, I think looks pretty good. You'll see it's pretty contrasty, and that's the thing I really like with this DTD filter, is some of the wispiness on the outside edges of this nebula, I feel like come through pretty good, and you can actually tell that, that they're there. So I do like this. This is not like true background here. There are some wispy nebulous clouds in there that you can kind of see. So I, I do think that's cool. Now, when it comes to star halos, I'm actually gonna look here at one of the subs because with processing, we can do a lot of magic, right? But really, the the quality of a filter should be evaluated on the subframes. So uh, star haloing, like I said, I don't think it's that bad. I think it's just fine. But if I go up here to the top right corner, these little black streaks are probably caused from vignetting in my optical system, probably from the focal reducer on my Draco 62. Now what's interesting about this is when I stacked this in PixInsight, this star at the top right somehow came down. <laughs> so I don't know if there's some sort of weird stacking artifact, artifact issues here, but the star here still maintains those kind of black streaks going through it. But overall, even that star doesn't look horrible to me. If, if you look at it from the zoomed out view, it's not like the worst thing in the world. The Draco 62 actually does a pretty good job. If I zoom to the corners here with this APS-C size sensor, the stars still look, look pretty good. Um, granted, of course, this is the processed version. So let me, let me show you the unprocessed version. Scroll over to the right here. Yeah, so I still think the stars look pretty good on this image. Now, the cool part about this filter, like I said, though, is you know, you can image emission nebula, but it's also excellent for galaxies as well. So I did take an image of Markarian's chain and want to show that as well. Here's my image of Markarian's chain. So again, I'm going to go ahead and start on the uh, light frame here on the right. But just looking at the stars, there's not a ton of bright stars in this field of view to take a look at as far as star haloing goes. But just as I was mentioning, the NBZ has so few star halos that comparing the DTD to it, of course, the DTD is going to have higher halo numbers, but 
it doesn't look that bad to me. It looks pretty good. And there's just galaxies everywhere in this field of view. So sometimes it's a bit tricky to tell what's a, a galaxy and what's a star. Uh, but overall, I think that the DTD does handle star halos all right, even with that near-infrared transmission. Now, if I look at the processed image, the background is not super clean. It's what I like to call swampy. <laughs> I know it's a weird term, but there's a little bit of like almost greenish, purplish waviness to the background. It's not super clean. And uh, it's a weird term that I came up with, but it just kind of looks like a swampy background to me. So I did run SCNR on this to remove the green, but it's still not the best background. Certainly could use more integration time here. But the galaxies, those came through nicely in this filter. So this was just the Draco 62. You can see this chain of galaxies here, a lot of the Messier objects in here. They look really nice. Now, of course, I don't have the most resolution just because this is a 62 millimeter refractor and I'm using a 3.76 micron APS-C size sensor, but the galaxies come through really nice. There's one at the top right that I really like up here. You get a nice dust band here. It just looks really good. That wraps up my review of the IDAS DTD or Dusk to Daylight filter. I'd just like to thank IDAS for sending me this for review and I hope to be able to shoot a comment with it very soon. Feel free to leave a comment below and share your thoughts on this filter as it really does help out the algorithm. And speaking of the algorithm, it's not like I expect tens of thousands of views or anything like that. I don't consider myself an influencer. In fact, I would prefer not to be called an influencer. Uh, I'm not a professional reviewer and I don't even use a script. And you can probably tell. But if you go back several years on my channel from the beginning to now, you can see that I've always tried to pride myself on making good quality tutorials and reviews to help people out. And if the algorithm prevents people from seeing this that might be interested in it, it's kind of a bummer. So anyway, feel free to share, subscribe, or comment if you enjoy content like this. And as always, I do appreciate you watching. I hope you enjoy reviews like this. Have a great day and clear skies.